Hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show audio podcast. With your host, Kenneth Pokor. This is episode 12, recorded on June 25th, 2020. This episode of the EV Revolution Show is sponsored by File Sanctuary. Need a great web host for your business? Need to get email at yourdomain.com? They provide professional, feature-rich web and email hosting for any project you have in mind. Get started today at filesanctuary.net forward slash cloud and save 10% with promo code EV Rev Show. All right, well, welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show audio podcast, episode 12. Hope everybody's doing well, uh, coming slowly, coming out of pandemic lockdown. Uh, and remember, stay safe, follow your local health guidelines, please. It's important. We've got a long way to go. Uh, thank you again for tuning in. This is episode 12. It's been a while since I did the last show. I'm always hunting for smart people that know stuff about EVs. And this is a great show. I've got a fantastic gentleman. His name is Chad Curtin from Ford Canada. He's the Assistant Vehicle Line Marketing Manager of EV and Commercial. Hi, Chad. How are you? Welcome. Hi, Ken. Welcome. Uh, thanks very much today. I appreciate you taking the time to have me on the podcast, and I'm looking forward to having our discussion today. No problem. Well, I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you very much. It, uh, it's, it's always a challenge, like I said, to find smart people that know something about EVs, not just how to spell it, but uh, can talk a little bit more about it. Uh, so folks who don't know, like uh, I'm part of the Electric Vehicle Society here in Canada, I have a local chapter and I'm doing some, some national stuff with them as well. And, and I met Chad virtually when he, uh, he and a co-worker did a presentation for one of the chapters a couple of months ago, kind of an update about Ford. So I thought, hey, let's, uh, let's, let's branch out, have a conversation here for a few minutes uh, to uh, tell my, my listeners um, and uh, some of the, and the viewers, of course, that follow me on YouTube. Um, you know, what, what's, what's up with Ford and uh, what's going on? Now, I, I'd like to start, Chad, by maybe going backwards a little bit, because I think a lot of people don't really understand Ford's history when it comes to electric vehicles. We all kind of understand Henry Ford and, you know, how he really kickstarted the automobile uh, industry from the manufacturing. But can you tell us a little bit about some of Ford's you know, history when it comes to electrified vehicles? Sure, Ken. I'd love to do that. And so Ford has had a long history of electrification. So Henry Ford, um, even though he started in 1903, he was tinkering with electrification. He had a uh, relationship with Thomas Edison, so a work relationship and a personal one. So um, back in 1914, his goal was to have a so-called Edison Ford uh, for about $500, slightly more than the Model T in the day. Um, so his wife, Clara, was a big EV advocate, and she drove the vehicle around, and they did a lot of testing with it. Um, but it was one of those vehicles that never kind of came to fruition. But, you know, over the years, um, we had some electric vehicles back in the 50s. Um, so, and then in 1966, we had the Ford Commuta. It was um, four 12-volt batteries at the time. We only did uh, 35 miles an hour. So, you know, it was in its infancy. But then we went That's along good. and we had the, um, the Ford Ranger Electric. Mm -hmm. We had yeah. our uh, Focus Electric. And now... Um, we're really getting into electrification. We have $11.5 billion that we've committed uh, through to 2022. Mm -hmm. So um, we'll have the Mustang Mach-E, which is very exciting for me. And um, then we've had some other vehicles that we've announced. So the 22 model year Transit electric. Mm -hmm. That's and then right, we have yeah. um, an F-150 coming along in the future as well. So Yeah. And we'll, we'll talk about those because those are certainly exciting vehicles, especially the 150. And, you know, again, it is great to see because a lot of people forget that EVs actually were the first vehicles that you know they've been around since the mid 1800s you know even thomas edison uh, drove one across the us or on a thousand mile endurance uh, test or something like that way back in the 1870s 1880s something like that so you know it's not not new technology from from just the general concept but you know obviously with ford mass production and with with the the pathway to internal combustion that was the way to do it at the time for multiple reasons and that's kind of what's been the standard for the last 100 or so years um, but, you know, I'm glad that you point out some of those milestones for Ford because you guys have been been in the electrification game, uh, dibbling and dabbling. And I know you're in some other green technologies as well for many years. So it's certainly uh, great to see that. Now, I know that, you know, upon building, upon now really going more, you mentioned some of the, the, the uh, um, 
uh, expenses and, and the capital investments that Ford is doing over the next several years for an electrification strategy. Now that mar- maps into, I think what you guys are calling your smart vehicles and, and smart cities type of approach. Can you explain a little bit more about that? Yes, so um, our um, Bill Ford is very big on making sure that we um, have a better world for our uh, family and for our children that we've living. So what he has is um, a smart connected world. So he wants to stop congestion, wants to have the privilege that everybody should be able to move around the world freely. So in doing so, we've been looking at different modes of transportation. So it'll be the internal combustion engine, electrified vehicles. Um, We have partnered with uh, AI Argo. So working on some autonomous vehicle technology, we um, mm. have electric scooters. So we, we acquired a company called Spin. Mm-hmm. So um, overall, what we're trying to do is see if we can work with regulatory um, kind of agencies, work with cities, see ways that we can have vehicle, the vehicle connectivity, vehicle to infrastructure. So it's one of those, I think, uh, long term that we're looking at ways that we can add to society and not just be you know, a, a producer of automobiles. It'll be a mobility company. And is it safe to say that Ford recognizes that the you know industry and consumers and all various different sources um, need to look at CO two emissions uh, and other greenhouse gas emissions and and do something about it? You know, do their part. Um, is there a strategy, a corporate strategy around that? For, uh, yeah, for sure there is. Ken, we've done a lot, um, and if not solely on electric vehicles. Mm -hmm. So we've done stuff if it's our uh, greenhouse gases from our plants, our assembly operations, uh, ways that we can convert some of our paint fumes to fuel, Mm -hmm. um, done rainwater management uh, with our EcoBoost engine. That was one where we used our internal combustion engines to get better fuel economy and performance. So we've done things um, along the way if it's bringing in hybrid powertrains, uh, plug-in electric vehicles, so what we did find is um, some of our electric vehicles were smaller on a production scale. So you know when you looked at our Focus Electric, mm-hmm. um, the impact of that is not as big as an F-150 where you change the fuel economy savings on the EcoBoost engine. So over time, we've kind of worked on ways that you know we can get more electrified vehicles and find ways that we can make a better CO2 kind of uh, output from our vehicles that we currently are producing. Mm-hmm. What's been up until you know the recent uh, times what in your opinion and Ford's opinion has been kind of the biggest barrier to kind of getting into more of a full electrification strategy? Has it been supply chain? Has it been the battery technology? Has it been consumer awareness? One, all of the above, what do you think? So I think it's um, it, it's kind of a marriage of all those points that you mentioned, Ken. So there's a uh, customer awareness. We did some independent studies and a lot of consumers don't really know much about electric vehicles. Mm-hmm. So they feel that, you know, um, they can't perform well in inclement weather, uh, that they still need fuel, which I found kind of interesting. It's an electric vehicle. Um, <laughs> yeah. And then it's just the kind of the, the tipping point of the cost. So there's the yeah. R&D involved. There's the, the supply chain, the actual kind of ramping up the procurement. So if we're only building, you know, thousands of vehicles, it's going to be a lot more on a um, cost base for the, the vehicle than if we're doing hundreds of thousands of vehicles. Mm-hmm. So I think it's one of those, it was kind of the chicken egg scenario is, you know, we're yeah. trying to get what consumers want. But consumers don't want to, to pay that much more for the electric vehicle. And I know um, a big factor, too, has been federal and provincial incentives that have kind of been helping to, to spur some of that innovation. Um, mm-hmm. So I think it's one of those, the, the cost per kilowatt hour for the batteries has been going down over the last couple of years. And it's getting to a point where, you know, with the Mustang Mach-E, with the Transit, with the F-150, we're going to leverage our scale and kind of our supply base to build more of a production, uh, large volume vehicle. Mm-hmm. So I think we're kind of at that point that over the last couple of years, we have been in and out, as you mentioned, or dabbled in it, but now we're, we're all in on electric. So, Yeah, it certainly is. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'd like to put this into perspective. I mean, yes, we're Canadian. We're, we're you know, living in Canada. We're talking about it. But, um, you know, people have to remember that the Canadian automobile market uh, landscape is very small. Um, you know, a couple of million a year is kind of where we're at from a, from a national sales perspective. And that's all vehicles, uh, vehicles and light trucks combined. And, you know, you look at, the five major markets, you know, you've got, you know, US, Europe, China, uh, I guess, Japan, and I forget what the fifth was, maybe Korea, I don't remember. Um, but, you know, these are huge markets by, by scale, you know, I think the, the US auto market is somewhere in the area of 45 million, if I'm not something like that, if I'm not uh, mistaken, uh, right. or, or 40 ish. So, you know, it's, it's massively and, and, you know, we, 
we unfortunately, it's hard for Canada to be a leader in that market because we're such a small market. Um, so, you know, uh, there were, I, I talked to somebody the other day who said, you know, that U.S. is kind of the trend center. And there, there's a lot of validity to that because of the sure magnitude just of the California market, never mind the rest of it. So, you know, when OEMs are looking at electrification and from a, you know, you guys are in, in a business to make money, right? <laughs> you're, I mean, sure, you do a lot of charity stuff, but you can't do that without making money. So it, it has to line up eventually. And, you know, look at Tesla. God love them. They've, you know, it's taken a long time to, to start running into progressively profitable quarters uh, of, of, of earnment, right? Uh, so, um, you know, you know, I guess what's your response to people when they say, well, why do you guys take so long to get into this? Because, you know, Tesla has been driving it for 10 years and, you know, Nissan started with the Leaf in 2010. You guys had some early stuff. Again, is it just, is it just awareness or, I mean, there's a lot of financials involved, correct? Is it, so there, there's the financials, like you said, because we have a separate division that we set up uh, called Team Edison. So um, their kind of role in the company was to kind of break off from Ford Motor Company to be almost like a startup to kind of uh, reduce the cycle time that it would take to build a vehicle. You normally it would take, you know, four to five yep. years kind of from conception to production. Um, so for the Mustang Mach-E, they were able to do that within two years. So they kind of wow. cut it in half. That's super um, fast. That's really fast. And I guess to your point is uh, the U.S. kind of is the main kind of um, driver of kind of the, the cycle plan for our vehicles. At least so for North I, America anyway, right? For North America, correct. Yeah. So uh-huh. for us, um, being about 2 million kind of units, as you had mentioned, in Canada versus, you know, the, the 40, 40 million in the U.S., mm-hmm. um, kind of sometimes our needs in Canada don't get as much kind of um, sure. merit, I guess. Is mm-hmm. that the right word? But, and yep. I know even for Canada, our um, pure electric vehicles was about 2% of the sales in 2019. Correct. So yeah. when you look at it that way, kind of from Good a business enough. case, you say, you know, mm-hmm. there are some major players, as you mentioned, but, um, you know, the yep. kind of slice of the pie is still very small. Um, over the next couple of years, though, if you can kind of read a lot of stuff in the press, there is a lot more entrance coming. Mm-hmm. Um, and what we find, too, is that people want, more of an SUV kind of vehicle. There is still demand in Canada for, you know, cars yeah. and sedans, but we've kind of pivoted as a company to meet the demands of customers. So that's why our Mustang Mach-E um, isn't a traditional sports car. You know, it's a, an SUV. So <laughs> yeah. we got a lot of flack from that, but, um, you know, using that name, we had to make sure it drove like a Mustang. So it has the right. driving dynamics. It's got the look. It's got the aggressive kind of uh, steering characteristics and the sound of it. So we're excited about that. Yeah, funny you say sound on an EV, which is typically quiet, but, right. <laughs> you know, you got to have that experience. No, I get it. Um, and, you know, absolutely right. You know, so again, when you frame it as a, you know, 2% of, of uh, or 2.5% of a 2 million market, you know, from an, from the billions that it is to, to build cars, again, look at Tesla, how much money they've had to spend to, to build the cars that they have. Um, you know, it takes, it takes some time. And now you guys are predicting, though, uh, really unprecedented level of growth in, in electric vehicles. Obviously, you know, it's not 100% certain the numbers because of the pandemic and how things are going to flesh out for, for uh, economies moving forward. But, you know, certainly something in the area of 8.5% by, by 2025 um, in, in the U.S., um, you know, 15% adoption in Europe and, and 14% in China. You know, and I, China is now, I just read, uh, are extending their, their equivalent of the ZEV mandate. I think it's the NEV or something like that, NEV, where they're extending it now a couple of years, which is good because they've been kind of in and out of, of incentives for a little bit, but it seems to be that they're back into it. Um, so is that a driving force for getting Ford excited about electrification? It, uh, sure it is, Ken. And I, I guess the forecasting we have is, you know, speaking to consumers, would, would be their next vehicle purchase? Would they be interested in an EV? Um, so to you mentioned, even by 2028, that's when we really see it taking off. So in China, it'd be about 23%. In Europe, it'll be you know upwards of almost a third. Uh, North America's a little smaller at 11% because I know a lot of uh, customers still want their large SUVs. So we've got yep. to kind of find a way to make it you know, a, a profitable vehicle with a, a large kind of... Uh, yeah. But luckily, we got all we got all this space that we could drive big cars around, you know. For, sure. I mean, yes. Compare it to Europe or China or Asia landscapes, right? Right, and it's one of those two. I think too, um, with the kind of a regulatory framework of you know you have to have lower uh, CO two emitting vehicles. You have to spend all that R and D and time and effort on uh, the existing internal combustion engines. So each year, as it gets more and more stringent, you have to put more um, engineering, more kind of. Uh, I guess it would be polluting control kind of mechanisms in the vehicle. So there's a point where, you know, if you can get a battery electric vehicle that's around the same price as an internal combustion, then you kind of forego building the internal combustions. But I think in the Absolutely. short term, we'll still have 
hybrids, plug, mm -hmm. plug in electrics, internal combustions, and electric vehicles. So we're not going to um, completely go cold turkey right. and abandon the power right. train or propulsion systems we currently have. On that note, do you think, and I ask this to a lot of the OEMs, do you think that there's still a need for hybrid vehicles versus a plug in hybrid based on the battery technology now that's available um, and, and the, per, you know, the less reliance on a gasoline engine for a plug-in hybrid that you do for just a straight hybrid. Do you think hybrids have kind of seen their day and their, they should maybe go away? What do you think? So I think um, I know for our fleets, because I, I look after commercial mm -hmm. vehicles and electric, yes. um, there are some high mileage uh, Canadian fleets. So in the U.S., maybe they're more in the metro areas, but we do have a, a big rural kind of geography in Canada. Mm -hmm. So I think those uh, ones that are on larger routes that need kind of fuel the savings, that that's kind of how they'll uh, get that achievement on their fleet. Okay. So I think hybrid vehicles will still be there. There's still our savings for the fleets too for uh, brake pads, you know, maintenance because you get the regenerative braking. So I think in the short term, there still will be a need for hybrid vehicles. Okay. Um, and I think it's just because it's such a big scale. So if you've got someone that runs a fleet of a thousand units and they don't want to jump to a, a PHAV or a BEV, mm -hmm. uh, that the hybrid is still that for them. And I think there's a lot of um, fleets that we work with that have a capital budget and they have an ongoing maintenance budget. So the two of them need to kind of break down those silos and work together and say, you know, over the five to 10 years we have the vehicle, we can pay off that initial investment more for a, a battery electric or a plug-in hybrid. Yep, no, I understand, makes sense. And again, you know, when I, when I mentioned the people that, yes, you know, the auto market in general will move to electrification, but it's a slow boat that we have to turn. Um, and, you know, it's going to take, in my opinion, decades for that to, to really be completed. Um, that internal combustion vehicles aren't going to go away anytime soon. You know, like some people, you know, uh, God bless them for, for again, hoping that like guys like Tony Siba thinking that we're going to be into 50% adoption or higher on EVs in a few years. I think that's, that's premature. I'd love to see it happen. But the reality is, as you say, there's a lot of, of things to think about, both from a consumer and a commercial perspective that just don't happen overnight. And then, you know, infrastructure and the, the different economics of the countries and the regions and, political and all these other things that weigh into it. Yeah. And the bigger thing too, I think is just kind of getting people into the battery electric vehicles to see the, the the exhilarating drives, the acceleration, mm -hmm. the kind of range anxiety that's there. But yep. we have 90% um, of the people that we spoke to will charge overnight. They have less yep. than 30 kilometers a day of a commute that they're running. So exactly. I think it's the people that have to get over that mental hurdle of, I'm not going to the cottage on a long trip every week. <laughs> it's that, you know, half a dozen times a year or whatever it is. And they just have yep. to plan ahead. We have yeah. smart technology out there that'll show them, you know, here's the uh, charging stations along your routes. They just have to do a little bit of planning. Um, yeah, absolutely. Now, you mentioned earlier about the $11 billion investment, uh, you know, up to 2022, at least initial investment by Ford in EVs, you know, uh, that's on top of the original investments made already back from 2015 days in 2020. Um, so can you tell me a little bit more about where that investment's going and what it's, what it's shaping up to look like? Is it, so those investments will um, kind of bring to market those vehicles that I mentioned. So, you know, the Mustang Mach-E, the um, battery electric transit and the F-150 in the future. Um, so it's to cover the, the R&D costs. Mm -hmm. um, there'll be retooling of the assembly plants. Okay. Um, there's also kind of, uh, you know, partnerships with our suppliers. So mm -hmm. when we procure batteries, we have to kind of lock in to kind of make sure that they build yep. enough capacity for us. Um, and then there's the, the marketing part of it. I know with the Mustang Mach-E, we've foregone the traditional kind of uh, newspaper and radio. So we've done a lot of social there. Yep. Um, we found that these consumers are tech savvy. There's love is ever the, the new. Mm -hmm. um, and the pandemic's kind of changed things a little bit too, right? That we have to do things more online. So there's um, kind of several facets of that money that's in there. But I think the biggest one is just the um, people and the actual kind of tooling and supply base for that. Absolutely. So let's get into a little bit more of the meat here why, uh, why we have time, because I know we're a bit of a time limit. Um, so on that investments, part of that is, is a $500 million partnership with Rivian. Can you expand on what, what that partnership is going to look like or what it does look like? Sure. So, so what we did is, um, as you mentioned, we invested $500 million in Rivian. And um, our initial plan was to use their skateboard platform to build um, some Ford and Lincoln vehicles in the future. Mm -hmm. um, recently, we've announced that Lincoln will be foregoing that. So right now, they're not going to use yes. the Rivian platform. We're going to work on our own. So we're going to have our own kind of dedicated team or Lincoln DNA in there. Um, but it's one of those, we're looking at them to kind of see some of their technology. We've got um, some people from our company on their board of directors. So okay. um, yeah. 
going forward, I think it's just more that we'll be developing an all new uh, battery electric platform. So we're going to mm-hmm. use some of Rivian skateboard technology for that. Great. Yeah. And, you know, maybe some of the supply chain or whatever, right? Whatever makes sense uh, right. from the business and makes yeah, sense. It's still in the infancy, but I guess, you know, yeah. we'll, we'll kind of mature that over time. Yeah. And I just heard, you know, that they're moving some of the more of their operations back to California to kind of co- consolidate some of their staffing and uh, line things up a little bit to make them more efficient as, again, we're all in a little bit tougher times. Now, in, in some of these alliances, you know, I do want to talk briefly about the Volkswagen Alliance, but um, if we talk about Rivian. I know there's a Bahindra uh, Alliance in, in India as well. Um, can you tell me a little bit about that? Is it, so that was um, a joint venture that we sent up. So mm-hmm. what we've done with there is um, just using some of their personnel and their kind of uh, technology information that we have w- w- yep. with our joint venture Mahindra. So um, there's a limited resource. So you've got teams that develop, you know, internal combustion Mustang or F-150 or other vehicle lines. Yep. So we're using some of their um, resources for that, but we haven't really divulged too much more information about that partnership. Mm-hmm. Now, you, when you did your presentation, you talked about the strategy on EVs that play into the Ford value chain um, and the innovation. And of course, you know, the top of that value proposition is going to be the, the, the Mach-E for sure. But, you know, you've got plans beyond the Mach-E. Um, and we'll get to that in a sec, the Mach-E specifically. But you've got, you know, your HEVF series, uh, HEV Mustang, Bev Transit, as we talked about earlier. Can you expand on those three? Sure. The, the one thing that we found is with battery technology, it's not always for range. It can be for performance. It can be for capability. Um, so what we've looked for in F-Series, um, and there'll be more information coming, but that HEV, people think, well, it's always going to be giving you you know, some fuel economy savings, but mm-hmm. maybe there's other ways that we can enhance the capability of our uh, built for tough truck. Mm-hmm. Um, same with the Mustang. So that'll be one where you know, maybe it's not you know, your slower kind of... Um, person that's going to be driving the vehicle that's pure for uh, fuel economy, but maybe it's off the line performance with the electric motors or with the hybrid technology. So mm-hmm. um, that's what we're kind of looking on the hybrid side for the electric transit. It'll be one where we're going to have the same uh, capability payload offering that our commercial customers want. So it'll be in a cargo van, a cutaway and chassis cab. So there's not um, that right. kind of limited performance of the vehicle where they figure, well, you know, I need to have my internal combustion because I need to, um, move a certain amount of you know cargo every day right so mm-hmm. it's a no compromise vehicle so what we found from our customers is you know they want electric vehicles for their fleets so they have sustainable it'll be kind of goals but they don't want it to be well geez i got to have one of these kind of ugly ducklings in the corner right yeah you know so exactly. the, this is the driver that gets stuck with this one this week yeah yeah well you know it's a big market i talk a lot about you know that that short medium haul market i mean on the commercial side i mean you know delivery trucks and all kinds of applications, you know, for, for commercial or small business use, things like the transit, you know, I mean, these, these are things that people will put 500,000 kilometers, a million kilometers on without even thinking about it uh, right. as a workhorse until the things drop. So, you know, to be able to electrify those, which are usually, as you said, in more urban centers, start and stop, all that kind of stuff uh, makes sense. Now, of course, before we get to the Mach-E, F-150. So, I mean, you guys, I love that, that, that promotional video about pulling the uh, the pickups on the rail, <laughs> the train, that was really good. Uh, so, uh, you know, my hat's off to your marketing department for putting that together. Very eye-catching. But, you know, it shows the torque. It shows the the capabilities of EVs um, that, that they can do. They're not just little golf carts on wheels uh, that have, has covers. Um, so the F-150 is going to be, you know, a, it's a major vehicle for Ford, right? It's the number one selling uh, uh, vehicle um uh, or second number most selling vehicle in the world, if I remember correctly, single model line. Um, so it's that big. It's very important. Uh, you know, how do you see that electrification of the F one fifty happening? So I think maybe I'll just kind of go back in history a little bit. Mm-hmm. There, Ken. I know um, when we had the change to a two point seven liter EcoBoost, we had a lot of people saying, "Well, no, I will never drive one of those. It can't perform as much as my you know five liter V eight." Right. Uh, or, right. or when we went from the um, steel body structure to the, the all aluminum people thought we were kind of nuts with that right because you know how are they going to fix this and you know for fuel economy savings we thought it was the right thing to do so i think for electrification there's going to be a lot of naysayers or people saying well, you know i don't really know if i want to drive this vehicle like is it going to perform as well as my truck when i'm pulling my boat or you know at the construction site um i think there'll be a lot of benefits for the vehicle as well because it can go where gasoline vehicles can't so if you're inside a um, building you know, driving around in there, or if there's certain um, kind of city centers that they've alluded to that you won't be able to drive a gasoline vehicle in the near future mm-hmm. there. So zero I think emission zones, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
so that, that'll work well for us in that way. Um, it, it'll be probably, and this is just me speaking, I don't really know, but uh, uh, you'll have your early adopters that really want it. Mm-hmm. Then there's going to be people that they're going to be a little skeptical. So they hear the word of mouth, their friends and family, you know, people that sure. have one of them that they can drive, but um, we're really looking forward to it. I, I know we've said it'll be coming in the near future. I, I do believe that um, Jim Farley had mentioned it'll be in 22 calendar year. So mm-hmm. it's exciting. It's not too, Great. too far away. No, it's not that um, far away. Yeah. And I mean, every day I see more um, entrants coming into the truck market. You know, yep. there's more and more OEMs that say that they're going to have a truck in the future. They may be at mm-hmm. an entry point pricing or they'll be more at an exotic kind of uh, mm-hmm. premium price. But I think everybody's out there and they realize that, you know, the pickup truck market is large. We've even seen mm-hmm. our sales increase over the pandemic lately because you have those people that need it for their livelihood. Right. Yeah, so exactly. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, it'll be a no compromise vehicle, and it'll be one where you're not going to be able to really tell the difference except for a badge on it. It's not going to be a, a science project or anything. It'll just be <laughs> a, a normal F-150 side by side with a different propulsion system. So you're not poking fun at any particular manufacturer on that comment, uh, but I get it. I get it. Um, do you anticipate uh, it still to be a um, uh, um, a body on frame design, or do you will you look at unibodies for that for the electrification side of it? Um, that's one of the videos that, that I don't look after the portfolio, okay. so I'm not really sure. I, I do know that it'll be kind of like a skateboard design. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. and it's still going to need the rigidity, the strength to kind of sure. be able to take the, the day-to-day beatings that people have on it. Mm-hmm. So I'm assuming mm-hmm. it'll be similar construction as our gasoline vehicle, but I don't know what enhancements right. or changes they might have, Ken. Do you have any intel on the amount of, uh, from a pickup truck perspective that you sell of the 150, 250, 350 lines? how many of those are into commercial versus consumer aspects and of the commercial, how many of those are modified? So IE a food truck or an ambulance or, you know, EMS vehicle or whatever, because that's one of the, the beauties of, of, you know, body on frame is you have that choice. You have, you know, un- almost unlimited type of variants that you can build on that platform to service your unique business or your, your use case, military, whatever. Do you have any intel on that? So for our F series, so that the 150 through 550, yeah, uh, we do about 50 percent to the retail consumers, so someone like you or I, yep, uh, and then but the other half is either small commercial, so someone okay. like myself that might have a fleet of two or three vehicles, you know, a uh-huh. landscaping business, to some of the larger major national fleets. So it's about a 50-50 split. Okay, um, and we we do do a lot of conversions with our chassis cabs and our cutaways. So um, you know, they'll make them into anything mm-hmm. that they need for their construction sites. Yeah, um, we also have. You know, with our transit, as I mentioned, we're going to electrify it. So we have our cutaway and uh, chassis cab there as well. Mm-hmm. So that'll be one where, you know, we can do a lot of uh, upfits and modifications to that as well. Excellent. But, Excellent. And th- that'll be a learning curve too for our yeah. upfitting companies of, you know, here's the battery on the bottom here and, you know, the mounting points and things that they normally would do with right. a gasoline vehicle that they can't do or they have to kind of modify their process. Right, right. And is it safe to say that the, the electrified uh, F-Series will be Will it be a conversion of the existing platform, in your opinion, or do you think it'll be a ground-up design? So for, for my initial That's kind of uh, discussions, um, like I said, I don't really cover that, but I think it's going to be an all-new design, so it'll be from the ground up. Okay. Um, so it's not going to be one where you kind of take the gasoline vehicle mm-hmm. and you just drop the engine transmission and bolt something underneath. I think yep. it'll be built around it. I know for our Mustang Mach-E, um, there's a lot of interior amenities that you're able to push out to the extremities. Mm-hmm. So even though, um, you know, it's got a certain exterior feel, it's actually larger from an interior perspective. Yes. So I think it's really interesting. Um, this is just me kind of speaking and speculating, but I think that the electric vehicle of F-150 will have a, a lot of uh, different creature comforts, technologies, and things that the gas uh, engine vehicle will not have. Nice, nice. And that's the beauty of a ground-up design. It gives you that latitude uh, to, vary, to make it variable because, you know, I'm a big believer the more choice you can give consumers, the more, the more reach you'll get out of them, right? If it's a very narrow focus uh, for certain job or certain applications, then you limit your market share. Let's talk about the Mach-E. So it is, it is going to be the flagship for electrification for Ford moving forward. I'm excited to see that it should be, it potentially should be hitting some uh, customers' hands. Is it next year from an official general GA perspective or by the end of this year? Any comments on ETAs? Yeah, so, so the plan still is um, to have some in market by the end of the year. Yep. Um, okay. Like most of the OEMs, we were impacted with the pandemic of kind of our assembly plants being closed, mm-hmm. um, but mm-hmm. we're still pushing to have some on the ground by the end of the year. The, the bulk of them will be coming early in 21, mm-hmm. um, but you should be seeing some kind of driving around by year end. 
Excellent, excellent. And you know, I know you have various, um, a whole slew of different various packages available for the Maki, which we won't get into because people can go on the website, look at them, look at pricing. It's all available now. It's all been GA'd through the different regions. But certainly, there's a lot of technology, and it's one of the things that EVs bring are very, very a lot of technology within them. Um, not only to run the BMS and the systems around the battery, but also a lot, a lot of safety elements to do that. And the Maki is certainly not, not going to be any slouch when it comes to technology. Can you talk a little bit about that? I know that you're talking about doing OTA uh, as an example. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so, so for the Maki, we did a lot of uh, research on what consumers are looking for from electric vehicles. So we do have uh, safety, which is very important. So it'll launch our new uh, Ford Copilot 360 2.0. Mm -hmm. So um, the vehicles will be coming with a prep package. So we'll have some over-the-air updates. So they'll be kind of like your phone. So they're seamless. They're done, you know, in your garage over the evening. Um, so we're going to have some hands-free kind of driving technology, but that'll be later um, in 21. Mm -hmm. um, as far as other technologies, you know, you have your, your standard kind of stuff you have on your electric vehicles. So you will have our charging station mapping, our um, e-latch. So that's kind of one thing that we did was interesting as you approach the vehicle. It'll know that you have your phone as a key, so it kind of uh, you know illuminates the door, and you kind yeah. of push a little button on the side to open up. Mm -hmm. um, we've got our new sync system. So we originally had our sync partnership with Microsoft back in yeah. uh, 2007. It's, so this it's is been our, around a while, yeah. Mm -hmm. so this is our fourth version, uh, Sync 4, um, and it's got some um, learning kind of capabilities. So it'll know your patterns as you know yourself or your wife driving the vehicle. So mm -hmm. if you normally call your parents at four o'clock every evening. It'll kind of prompt up there, uh, or if you've got certain um, kind of radio stations and stuff that you always play, or kind yeah. of your your favorite uh, watering hole, it'll kind yeah. of be on there for you. So, wow, um, Big Brother's watching almost. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so it'll know that that XM eight on uh, eighty on eight is my is my only station I listen to. I'm still stuck in that decade, but uh, okay, yeah, awesome. And, awesome. Uh, and from from a technology too, that it's interesting yeah. because we, we normally have our four by four or all wheel drive yeah. system. So for mm -hmm. an electric vehicle, you've got the electric motors. So mm -hmm. I think a lot of people will be uh, surprised and delighted on how this vehicle will handle. Um, you know, with the lower center of gravity and kind of yeah. the Mustang driving dynamics we put to it. So. Absolutely, I agree. People are surprised and will be when they get into EVs and as they do. And that's the beauty of EVs that you touched upon, uh, Chad. You know, because of the technology centered around it, uh, these software updates are critical because, you know, that's one of Tesla's sweet spots, you know, that they've been, been known for is, you know, you, you kind of actually get a better car with age versus the other way around with, you know, traditional vehicles can kind of depreciate and they kind of are what they are unless you aftermarket or something like that. But with, with the amount of, of controllability that are in the software side of an EV, you can do a lot of tweaks, you can do a lot of enhancements, especially with the technology that's there, um, cameras and all this other stuff, sensors, that, that almost the sky's the limit of what you can do. So it's, it's great that, you know, the Mach-E will fall into that place of, of being, you know, it'll just get better. It'll get, it'll get better with age. Uh, there'll be more features, and uh, it'll just never stop improving, basically, right? Right. Yeah, which is great. Um, I, and, you know, you'll have an app and all that stuff, as you mentioned, and the phone, which is great. Um, that's awesome. And, and now I, I touched upon, I know we talked talked about electric transit. I want to just switch gears a little bit to talk about, because that kind of links into um, the Ford and Volkswagen recent announcements on your partnerships with VW. I talked about on my last show, um, it's more of the commercial vehicle side, to my understanding, where you know VW is going to kind of focus on their city vans, um, and and Ford with their tra with their uh, Transit Connect. Um, there's going to be a midsize pickup uh, offering at some sort where Ford will take the lead, and then you know a, a one-ton cargo van where Ford will take the lead as well in in all transporters type of mechanism. But a lot of this is underpinning, I guess, a relationship with with a VW and their MEB platform, right? Using using that modular electric toolkit as the framework for Ford to bring out vehicles. Is that correct? Correct. And I think it's one of those, there's a lot of uh, initial investment. So mm -hmm. we've kind of partnered with Volkswagen to share some of that um, initial kind of startup funds that are required for that. So for um, commercial vehicles, we're a leader in North America and in Europe and other markets. Yep. So I think Volkswagen wants to leverage our commercial technology to bring vans to uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. um, and for us, we want to, um, you know, utilize some of their technology that they've got with their MEB platform. Mm -hmm. um, right now, we don't have kind of immediate announcements that we're seeing, you know, these vehicles will come at this timeline. But sure. um, right now, it's just kind of working um, on our own vehicles. And the one thing that's um, worth noting is the vehicles will have their own unique uh, characteristics. 
So even if we use some of their MEV platform or they have the commercial, it'll still feel and drive like a Ford or a Volkswagen. It's not that they're just going to take our Transit or Transit Connect and slap Volkswagen um, yeah. logo on it. Exactly. Yeah, for sure. No, it's great. I mean, you know, some of the numbers about, you know, Ford producing, purchasing 600,000 plus MEB platforms and components, um, you know, within the next few years to scale up um, to, you know, to help BW scale that up to about a $15 million plat, 15 million, excuse me, unit platform by, you know, before the end of the decade. So it's pretty incredible. Um, and, and I guess that's some, that's some of the great synergies about electrification is that you can, you, you know, you can say, Hey, well, I've got this great platform, you know, here you go. You know, so half of it's done. You, you do whatever else you want, the underpinnings and the, the body and all, and all that kind of stuff. And it gives you a lot of flexibility. And of course the synergies and the monies and the cost savings to get or to get, um, organizations into those efficiencies to scale much faster. Right. That's correct. And, yeah. Another thing worth mentioning, um, that I should have said earlier was that we initially had a um, equity stake in a company called AI Argo. Mm-hmm. So right. they're a California company that works on SAE for um, kind of self-driving technology. Yep. So Volkswagen has partnered with us as well on that. So mm-hmm. um, it'll be for producing vehicles, I guess, with the commercial and the MEB, but it's also for, you know, how do we work with other stakeholders to bring up our, uh, along the uh, advancement out of autonomous vehicles? Yeah, we don't have time to get into autonomous vehicles because I'll go on a bit of a rant there. <laughs> but you know, not that I'm against them. It just I, I'm not that for them either. You know, I, I'm a big proponent of safety systems, but I'm right. not going to trust a car to drive by itself, especially with a lot of drivers on the road. But uh, I don't want to forget, you know, some of the plug-in hybrids um, that you do have, specifically the Escape, the, the new Escape that's coming out with a really decent range, somewhere in the 65 to you know. Uh, 59 to 60 kilometer range on all battery, which I think is decent for a lot of daily use cases. Uh, my biggest beef with, with PHAVs has been just really small batteries. And most of that is for either carb emission standards or, or local regional uh, emission um, regulations that are there for OEMs to conform to. But, you know, when you put something that's going to really go head to head with the, the RAV4 Prime, um, it looks like a beautiful vehicle. That's great. Thanks for the feedback. And, and we're excited to get back into the uh, the hybrid kind of escape. Because we had the original uh, back in 2010, the escape hybrid that was used a lot for taxis in New York City and other kind of uh, driving modes. So we um, looked at that battery technology and we've been able to you know increase the efficiency and reduce the size of it. So with the 2020 escape, we've got the hybrid and the plug-in hybrid as well. Um, and I think it's one of those, as we mentioned earlier, we're not going straight from internal combustion engines to battery electric. So right. Even our, our Lincoln portfolio, we're offering plug-in hybrids as well for our Aviator and Corsair. So I think it's for those people that, you know, like myself, I just commute about 25 kilometers a day, get access to the HOV lanes. Um, mm-hmm. And there's, you know, some people that say that they only fill up their tank maybe once every four to six months because they're right. using that sole battery kind of propulsion. So um, it's not for everybody, but but I think it's one of those, it's kind of, it's a bridge, you know, the people that want to kind of dip their toe in the electrification before they go all in on an electric vehicle. Yeah, absolutely. That's what I say about it as well. Yeah, and it gives people that, uh, if they're concerned about range anxiety, it gives them that uh, barrier of, you know, it loses that barrier of adoption and get them, get them involved. Uh, any closing comments on, you know, where you see Ford, uh, let's say it's 2030, let's say it's 10 years from now. What do you see coming from Ford? If you were to put on your crystal ball, your genie hat and make a prediction here. Yes, I think for me, I, I, I've been with the company for 20 years. Mm-hmm. I started in 2000. Wow, so you're I've young. Seen, yeah. <laughs> you started. Yeah. So I've, yeah. I've seen a lot of changes in the company, um, and I'm looking forward to, I think the next 10 years, everything's going to accelerate the pace of change. Uh-huh. So, you know, before, you know, you went from only an internal combustion engine to maybe kind of hybrids, but I think we'll have a lot more cloud connectivity. Um, we'll have more, um, I know you're not a, a big fan per se on the autonomous, but I think there'll be limited kind of uh, yeah. cases for that. Yeah. So maybe it's in very dense kind of uh, areas. Um, and the, there'll be more uh, electric vehicles out there. I, I think the big thing is it's that the whole uh, mobility solution. Right. So we'll be producing all of our vehicles, but I think as um, Bill Ford's kind of vision is to work more and more with city centers and how do we provide a um, holistic kind of solution. So um, I think th- that's kind of the utopian 10 years, but unfortunately right. um, people are creatures of habits. So, right. So I'm not sure how quickly everything will change. Um, and it's kind of one of those we can, try and bring the the uh, the horse to water but you don't know if they drink right so yeah um, exactly yeah. but uh, i think overall there's going to be a, a lot more kind of big data i guess if you want to call it that so you know if people do opt in to mm-hmm. sharing their data we can see how they're driving 
how they're charging, what they're using their vehicle for, and we can apply that to our future kind of product development. Mm-hmm. Is there any indication from a um, from a percentage of overall sales uh, that Ford is targeting in the next decade to be electrified at some point? I, I don't know. I'm asking if there's been any public numbers, like 10%, 20%, anything like that. So we don't have a target per se. Like what uh-huh. we do is we do a lot of uh, customer clinics and kind of yep. demand. So we'll bring out the vehicles that we've heard that customers would purchase. And then it's kind of them actually taking out their wallet and buying them. Mm-hmm. Um, I know we had some forecasts. I think by 2028, North America was um, upwards of 11%. Mm-hmm. And then there was more in China and Europe. So we'll kind of take those third-party studies and kind mm-hmm. of our internal metrics, and we'll try and build our supply base and our programs to hit those numbers. Good. Okay. Um, but we don't have a target saying that thou shalt sell 25% of all vehicles electric mm-hmm. uh, in the next 10 years. Right, right. No, well, that's, that's, that, you know, that's a great answer because at least you, you recognize the fact that something needs to be done and your you know, organization is putting a lot of money behind it, a lot of effort, manpower, synergies, uh, agreements, cooperative uh, uh, you know, operations, all that kind of stuff behind it. So uh, certainly exciting times for a company that's uh, one of the originals <laughs> out there. Yeah, they've been around for over 100 years and looking forward yeah. to another 100, right? I'm sure. I'm sure. Certainly. Well, well, you guys weathered the last storm without having to take any bailout money. So, you know, if there's something to be said there, um, you know, out, out of the big three, uh, you guys, uh, if I remember correctly, uh, you guys didn't put your hat out for any funds. So unless it was a very small amount. No, yeah. But back in 08, what we did is we yeah. just um, leveraged our brand and we took out a, a big kind of line of credit, I guess, or, mm-hmm. was, you know, made sure that we had the available liquidity to weather the storm. Yeah. Um, and, and it paid off well. I think it got us some good um, press with consumers and it got us, you know, that yeah. we're here for the long term. It's a family owned company. Um, you know, th- there's a lot of pride that Bill Ford and his family have there. So we didn't want to have to, you know, be sold to someone else or we re- have to restructure that way. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah. But, you know, and that's something to be said, something to be said about some of the characters. So whatever people think, you know, I'm glad that we've put that out there and maybe give them something to think about and say, oh, yeah, you know, I kind of didn't really look at it from that perspective. So I'm excited about the future of Ford and I hope other people are. Again, you know, I know that you guys have had some earlier products and have been one of the earlier adopters as well with some of the products you mentioned uh, earlier in the show. And uh, and I do see them. I mean, I just, you know, I passed a fusion on the way to come home today for this call and, uh, you know, another energy symbol on it. So I see them all over the place. So uh, it's good to see that. And and thank you, Chad, for you taking the time and for, you know, for you doing what, what you do as, I guess, the EV ambassador for Ford Canada. That's great. Thanks very much, Ken. As a passion of mine, I've always been interested in sustainability and electric vehicles. And to your point, sometimes I think people look at the, the mainstream vehicles that sell and, you know, electrifications off to the side. So my role in Canada is to kind of be a proponent for that, mm-hmm. try and push for it. Um, you know, when we speak to our U.S. counterparts, say, you know, here's where Canada lays, you know, here's the landscape of electric vehicles. We'd like that a lot quicker than we can. Sometimes, you know, it's hard to kind of get the, the ship to steer or to turn, as you'd mentioned, but uh, what we're excited at Ford, and we're really looking forward to the products we're going to bring into the customer shortly. Well, that's fantastic, and I'm excited too. And I am excited eventually when uh, we'll start seeing the escape, uh, the sorry, the Mach E out there in the fall or, or or late part of this year. It'll be exciting to see that vehicle. And uh, it's you know I saw it at the the February car show. Couldn't get too close because it was up on a ramp, uh, roped off. But it certainly did look nice. And by the video and uh, reports that I've read on it is certainly going to be a great vehicle for Ford. So, uh, you know, again, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule. I'm glad that you and your family are safe and uh, hopefully we'll, we'll circle back in six months or so. And we'll kind of recap maybe how our prediction hats fare, fared for this year and see where things are at. If you don't mind. Yeah, that sounds great. Ken. I'm looking forward to it. Anything I can help to, uh, you know, bring the, the Ford story forward. I appreciate that and uh, the time that you have today. And yeah, in six months or so, we can kind of see how things are and give you an update. That'd be great. That'd be fantastic. Well, thanks very much again, Chad, for joining me on today's show and all the best to you. Thanks very much, Ken. Have a great day. And for everybody listening, thank you very much for taking the time to listen to the audio podcast. Please, I hope everybody is staying safe and following uh, public guidelines wherever you live. And until the next show, um, you know how to find me. You can always watch my videos at the EV Revolution channel on YouTube. Please check those out as well and subscribe. And I'll try to get a little bit more frequent on these podcasts as we move forward. Again, it's just tough to find people sometimes that want to talk. Anyway, thanks everybody for listening. Take care and we'll talk to you next time.